Thank you very much. You make made me look more interesting than I'm really. Uh, so thank you very much. <laughs> So, dear participants, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome you to this gathering focused on this intersection of two critical, I believe they are really critical, academic and political debate concepts, populism and environmental crisis, sorry. These are absolutely hot topics, like we say today, hot topics, in our daily affairs. With its promises of giving voice to the good people, I think it's a very critical concept as well, the good people against elites and globalism, populism has been one on the rise across the globe in recent years. The environmental, sorry, environmental crisis, I have a problem with this word, <laughs> sorry, uh, poses an unprecedented threat to our planet and demands urgent action. However, in this intricate landscape, the influence of populism cannot be ignored. To better comprehend these complexities at play, Dr. Heidi Hart will shed light on the multifaceted relationship between populism and the environmental crisis. I'm getting better with the word. <laughs> Dr. Heidi Hart is a researcher and educator based in the United States and Scandinavia. She holds a PhD in German studies from Duke University. I, actually, I, I know someone in Duke University, uh, James uh, Lauren Matori from African studies. <laughs> yeah, um, and focuses on intersections of the arts and politics, in, including in, in, environmental crisis. The word is for seeing me. Uh, she's currently a guest researcher at 68 Art Institute in Copenhagen, uh, where she has contributed curatorial work on climate art and at the Linus, is like we say it, Linus, uh, Linus University, Linus, yeah, mm -hmm. sorry, Linus University Center for Intermedial and Multimodal Studies, where she's completing the research project, Instruments of Repair. The room is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Heidi Art, for, the, for this moment. We are really exciting to hear you. Thank you so very much for this kind introduction and for being here and uh, congregating around these really important questions. Thank you also for the introduction to uh, the connection of populism to environmental concerns. Sometimes that's not the most obvious, but uh, but it's also important to consider. Uh, and as I was mentioning to the hosts earlier, I am not a policy expert, so I look forward to learning from all of you as well. Uh, I focus mainly on the ways in which ideology is mediated in cultural products. Um, and that includes populist ideology and environmental thinking. Um, so this has been a, a really great opportunity for me to deepen my knowledge as I've prepared for this talk. Uh, but again, I look forward to learning from all of you as well. So I'm going to share my screen. And start a slideshow here. Okay. So uh, the title of my talk is Populism and Environmental Crisis from Denial to the New Deep Ecology. So uh, this really is a multifaceted area because the uh, divisions between right and left are not always obvious when it comes to populism um, and environmental concern, as we will see. Um, the, after I submitted my abstract and reading list, um, an article appeared that I helped to author with uh, Yvonne Escobar Fernandez titled What's Under Green Eco-Populism and Eco-Fascism in the Climate Crisis. So I'm just putting this out here in case uh, some of you might want to look at this. Yvonne did a great job uh, working on providing some historical perspective on various populist responses to environmental crisis. And these include um, Fridays for the Future, the Greta Thunberg movement, um, as well as uh, various sagebrush rebellions in the US. I'm using that term in a plural sense because there have been quite a few, especially during the Trump era. Uh, incidents of uh, ranchers and farmers in the Western US who have um, gone against uh, federal regulations, have wanted to reclaim the land in ways that um, 
are nationalistic, but in a sort of anti-government way, a uh, very strange American phenomenon that uh, happens quite frequently. Uh, so we, we looked at this and also the Agua Zarca Dam conflict in Honduras, uh, which resulted in the assassination of several activists in 2016. So uh, if you want to take a look at this article that sheds some additional light on these uh, sometimes strange intersections of left and right in eco-populism. I'm going to uh, move into a table here just to set us up with some categories that might be useful as we're looking at populism and the environment. Um, and these are, are from a, uh, the Palgrave Handbook of Populism, which is very useful, uh, thinking about ontology, the sort of um, justification behind different perspectives, epistemology, or how knowledge is uh, generated and centered, global cooperation, and some examples. So we have um, the populist radical right wing, and the uh, ontology behind this is national versus rootless cosmopolitans. Uh, this sounds a little bit like Nazi ideology from the 20th century, uh, the threat of cosmopolitanism, uh, discontent against the ruling elite. And this is something that crosses a lot of political lines, this uh, resistance to uh, the powers that be, nativism, protectionism, uh, cultural homogeneity, traditionalism, you know, these traditional values. Um, and uh, the people as imagined uh, in a national context. Often we see climate skeptics in this uh, right wing radical perspective. Um, and uh, there's uh, often conspiracy thinking about uh, international global uh, corporations and things like this. Um, uh, then we have the populist market liberal libertarianism is another way this is framed sometimes. This is more based in individualism and free market thinking. Um, running states is business against big government. Business comes first. Uh, this is particularly notable when it comes to the fossil fuel industry and the lobbying forces behind this. Um, and then we see the, the left wing um, version of this, which has to do more with um, egalitarianism, anti-capitalism, uh, concern about climate justice and uh, equity. Uh, because as we know, the people who are most affected by climate crisis are those who uh, have the least uh, complicity in this. And there's a lot of injustice around who gets clean water, who has access to um, food sources, who gets protected if there's a pandemic. Um, so a, a lot of concern about justice, uh, a lot of more faith in science than we see often um, on the right. Um, and uh, again, concern about distributional effects and also uh, compensation for uh, those most affected by the climate crisis. So this is a rough outline of some of these positions Again, it gets more complicated as we look at the overlaps a little bit later, but I hope this is helpful in seeing at least an outline of these various forms of populism. Okay, so um, if we're looking at the, the right here, um, we need to move back one slide here, sorry about that. Um, we see that there are uh, different flavors of approaches to the environment. Not all of these are exactly populist, um, but it's important to look at them. Uh, so we have the authoritarian perspective that uh, we often think of these days when we hear the word populism. We think of uh, Erdogan perhaps, or uh, Trump. Um, we think of these leaders who gather a lot of energy around them um, and have a, a very, uh, strong sense of top-down thinking. Um, and I'm going to skip down to this quote here uh, from the Annual Review of Environment and Resources. Leaders who combine elements of authoritarian and populist rule attempt to control environmental resources in order to secure their political and economic power while placating and controlling human populations. So they may not be invested in the environment for its own sake, but they are invested in control of those resources. Uh, we also have the nativist, localist, agrarian perspective. 
Again, these sagebrush rebellions in the American West often show this. Um, we see this in Germany also sometimes, uh, where it gets uh, tricky with forest protection. Uh, we have left wing, wing and right wing interests at play there. Nationalist, patriotic ecology, as we see in France, identitarian uh, politics, liber libertarian, uh, more free market focused individual land use uh, va uh, valuation there. Um, and eco-fascist, which we'll get to a little more later, uh, putting nature first in a hierarchy, population control, anti-immigration, um, which humans get to be protected. That's a, an important question in that uh, eco-fascist mindset and violence. As we've seen in the Christchurch massacre in New Zealand, for example, or the um, massacre in Norway several years ago. Now, climate denialism, denialism, that's another tricky word to say, is a uh, part of many of these right-wing perspectives. And there are really two flavors of this that we see. Uh, first of all, just outright denial. It isn't happening. It's a hoax perpetuated by elites. And this was more common before most of us on planet Earth started to experience uh, higher temperatures, wildfires, floods, even in places that we would not expect to experience the climate crisis. Um, in Canada, these wildfires are uh, beyond compare and really scary because uh, we think about the North as being colder and safer, but uh, that really isn't a safe place anymore. And so the idea of the, the hoax is losing traction now because it's not so easy to just say, oh, it's, it's just in the scientists' minds. Um, so the perspective that I hear more often from climate deniers now is that climate cycles have always happened. It, this is not caused by humans or by the fossil fuel industry. Uh, it's just another cycle like the Little Ice Age or other warm periods in the past. Um, but again, this gets more complex. Um, and this has been a really helpful way to view this for me. Um, this Don't Confuse Me with Facts article. Um, and I'm just going to read this. The uh, ACC refers to anthropogenic climate change, so caused by humans. The denial of ACC does not necessarily limit itself to a narrow battle over the dominant scientific truth that ACC is real. We suspect that as CC climate change skepticism is woven into the fabric of a broader scope of resistance, therefore trust in established public institutions with responsibility for questions of environmental governance is a critical variable. Given the somewhat obscure and diffuse nature of CC impacts, most people are left to rest their opinions in the trust they have for experts and the various institutions that communicate ACC and implement actions that will affect our everyday life in the future. And this narrative is continually challenged by alternative experts claiming contradictory truths. I know in the US, uh, especially during the Trump administration, we heard a lot of uh, Trump supporters say things like, oh, do your research, do your own research, which usually meant going down various internet rabbit holes that were not scientifically supported um, to follow ideas about uh, vaccination suspicion or uh, other conspiracies. And so this uh, alternative uh, fact finding is uh, quite a threat actually to understanding the science, that the actual climate science behind what's happening to our planet. So on the other side, we have left-wing eco-populism and protest culture. And um, so some examples in our photos here, we have the Dakota Pipeline water protectors here in the US. This was from one of the camps. Uh, for the, These were long-term efforts to uh, to protest this pipeline and also create solidarity with indigenous tribes in the US. Uh, we also have the coal protests in Germany that have become much more heated as a result of uh, the war in Ukraine, the Russian um, invasion, and uh, the problem of German dependence on Russian oil and trying to dissociate from that. 
And uh, on the bottom left side, this is a, an image from a conference I helped to organize in Kalmar, Sweden in March. And as part of the conference, we invited the rebel mamas to take part. And these are the, uh, it, well, it's a part of the Greta Thunberg Fridays for Future movement. These are often um, older women, grandmothers, uh, women with kids who are thinking about the future for future generations. And they tend to be very warm and they love to sit in circles and sing songs. And at, at first glance, they seem like a sort of hippie group, but they are also not afraid to be confrontational. And so it was really helpful for us to invite them into a roundtable discussion by a bunch of academics about mediating the climate emergency and to hear them say to us, uh, how are you going to talk about these issues outside of your academic bubble? And they really got us to think about that in important ways. And so I'm very grateful for these groups. Um, so that's one manifestation of uh, protest culture on the left wing uh, of things. Um, this other image you can't really see too well, but there's some uh, windmills, wind turbines in the background. And you probably have heard about this recent controversy in Northern Norway about putting in wind power on uh, traditional Sami grazing lands for the reindeer. And it seems like these are two environmental agendas that are colliding. Um, the, the Sami tradition of working with the land in grazing their reindeer and the need for green power sources. Uh, Greta Thunberg herself showed up on the steps of the Norwegian parliament building to be part of uh, the protest against wind power. And so uh, these issues do get more complicated than they may at first appear. Uh, there are also controversies now about uh, the younger generation, uh, this group called the last generation, uh, going into art museums and uh, throwing things on paintings or gluing themselves to roads. Uh, they're called the Klimakleber in Germany, the climate gluers or climate stickers uh, who stick themselves to roads as we see on the, the right side here. Um, Greta Thunberg has been uh, arrested herself a few times. This was in Germany where this photo was taken protesting the coal mine. Um, and just a few weeks ago, she also uh, was in trouble with the police in Malmö, Sweden for uh, not leaving the scene of a blockade of oil trucks. And so uh, she's still very active, even though uh, the Fridays for Future uh, school strikes um, have come to an end as a result of her graduating, but she's definitely not going to be silenced. Uh, then uh, the next photo we have, the third one over is from the Cop City protests in Georgia, not far from where I live. And uh, this has been a really politicized uh, protest um, about a, a compound that's supposed to go in to train uh, cops and militaristic policing techniques, uh, controversial enough as it is in the US, but the problem is an old growth forest that uh, these protesters want to protect. And so um, the accusations of violence have been really controversial and uh, it's, it's been a really difficult situation there. So uh, this is not always uh, peaceful, sit in a circle with your guitars kind of protests. These can often be very controversial and uh, that's the point at this stage. I'm going to uh, move into a question now before we get into more description of these overlaps between different populists and populist environmentalisms because um, I'm wondering about motivations often behind these different positions. This image comes from an art exhibit in Kalmar, Sweden that was part of our uh, conference in March uh, called Solastalgia. And this term means not just nostalgia for something lost, but um, a sense that your homeland has been changed or your, your home ground has been so profoundly changed that you can't it will not return and you can't go back to that. Uh, so it's a little uh, more charged than just nostalgia. And uh, this image by Emma Telema is I think very powerful. This, this being embedded in the ground, really loving the ground, but having to wear a mask because it's not safe to be there. And the, the color red really indicates emergency in some way. So what I'm wondering here, and this may come up in discussion later, is um, if we have uh, these two basic positions 
um, that might overlap between right and left. Uh, one, nostalgia and fear. If you're a traditionalist, you've lived on the land for a long time, um, and you're afraid of immigration, you're maybe afraid of uh, governmental control of the resources. Uh, perhaps there's a water crisis and you wanna be able to keep using your water rights, but the government might tell you, no, you can't do this because we're in a drought. Um, this is happening in some places in the American West um, as we speak. And so there's this longing for the, the way things used to be, maybe an imaginary golden age, uh, this nostalgia and fear of the future. So this may be one kind of motivation for the uh, right-wing populist, nationalist, traditionalist mindset. On the other hand, in uh, more on the left, you hear a lot about uh, grief. You hear climate grief, climate anxiety, solastalgia, this uh, missing of the world that, that used to be a safe place for everyone and no longer is. And so uh, fear versus grief, uh, these two affects, uh, these two modalities of emotion seem to be very important. So it's not just about ideas when we talk about populism. A lot of populist ideology has to do with emotion as well. Um, so if we can kind of hold this question as we go through the rest of the talk today, um, to think about motivations, affect, uh, and see if that can inform our thinking a little bit. Um, now to move back to overlapping areas, these gray zones in green politics. Uh, I find these very, very interesting. I was uh, with some American students in Southern Germany a few years ago, and uh, they were very interested in all of the protest signs in the Black Forest against uh, wind power because people there didn't want their views to be spoiled. That was very important to them, um, having their forest views be sort of pure and pristine. And uh, that seemed like an environmental position, and yet the need for wind power seemed also very pressing. And so this was a good lesson for my students in things are not always uh, clearly delineated between political positions. Um, so hence our poster here, a protest against windmilling of whales with this green background showing um, the way the, the sort of ideal uh, green environmental space with the dangerous looking black windmills in the foreground. So one place we see these overlaps um, is in rural protest zones. And this might be uh, the area of the Dakota pipeline, for example, in the US or the Black Forest. Uh, where you might have uh, the more hippie impulse on the left confronting uh, the um, more traditional land-based farmers or ranchers who want to protect the land. Um, and so you, everybody wants to protect it, but from different perspectives and for different reasons. Another interesting zone of overlap is what I call purity culture. And this is uh, really interesting and problematic and uh, sort of painful um, for those of us who might be further on the left and value organic food and, and all of these uh, healthy um, attributes of uh, what we think of as green culture. Um, and then we also discover that, oh, there's this whole uh, right wing wellness culture that overlaps with this uh, that might have uh, vaccine suspicion involved uh, as we saw during the pandemic um, but that it might be also very attached to taking yoga classes and making sure that our children only eat organic food or whatever this might be and so uh, these zones of overlap are um, I think important to look at because they lead to some self-critique also I think that's helpful instead of getting really smug or feeling superior because we have the, the right position ideologically to be able to say, um, wait a minute, maybe there's some areas where we're veering into this territory that can be exclusionary perhaps. Um, so uh, that's an interesting zone. NIMBY environmentalism, not in my backyard. You might have heard this term. Um, this is also common in the US where uh, you see uh, often people who are city dwellers who have a, a liberal or left-wing political outlook and yet uh, get very upset if someone wants to develop a 
green high density housing project, for example, or more or less green um, project like this, or again, as we see with the, the wind power, sometimes not in my backyard, maybe I want to see this happen in the world, but not close to me. Uh, and this is another place where we see, you know, whatever your political outlook, that um, protection of your own little world becomes more important than the world at large. Another interesting zone of overlap is uh, indigenous appropriations. And we see this sometimes on the left with um, white people wanting to do uh, or participate in native ceremonies, wanting to uh, take on these spiritual aspects of indigenous culture. Uh, and we also see it on the, on the right. We see um, these uh, idealizations of uh, native culture, whether it's um, you know, idealizing a pagan past in Europe or Sami culture or Greenlandic culture uh, instead of actually engaging with it and learning from it and respecting it with distance and um, realizing that, that no, this is not ours and there are things we have to learn and might have to give up some things, if, especially in the land back movement. So another interesting zone there. Um, I'm just going to share a quote here. Uh, on some of this complexity, while environmentalism, uh, that word again, is at odds with populism's anti-elitism and anti-institutionalism, ecologism shares some features with populism's critique of the establishment, this is again a common theme, the elites and the global reach of the market. Where they disagree is the role of democracy. Ecologism usually subscribes to radical versions of democracy, while populism is oriented towards a strong leader. Now, this strong leader could even be local, as we see in the cases of the anti-government protests um, in the American West. Doesn't necessarily have to be a national leader, but the charismatic leader um, is important to that. Okay, so now we're going to get into deep ecology because this has some um, more contemporary manifestations that are very interesting uh, on, on the right, actually, and as well as uh, in the deeper hippie culture of the left, so uh, the, or hippie history, I should say. So deep ecology, uh, or that term really started with Arne Nass, who was an activist and thinker in Norway in the mid 20th century. And uh, this is an older model now for us, we see this as sort of a, a maybe even outdated model of putting nature first, of seeing all is connected. Um, and it's very romantic, I think, in the capital R sense of viewing nature. I'm just going to read a quick, um, quotation from some of this writing um, that uh, the, we are humans are left without a home we're fugitives in our world uh, we belong to cultures that have failed to recreate a sense of free nature as our true home archetypal nature archetypical nature recognized by its rhythms and tides um, because our cultures have failed to pass on this precious understanding, free nature has lost standing. So this idealization of nature, um, this, this virgin nature that of course does not exist, but um, it, it would be nice. Uh, so uh, another problematic aspect of this is uh, the German take on a deep ecology thinking, which comes through Heidegger, who was himself part of the Nazi party. And he talked a lot about rootedness and he looked at this in terms of word roots and cultural roots and also literal tree roots um, and in terms of being as a, a, a depth or a placement that was deep in the world. And on the surface, this sounds really appealing. Uh, but because of Heidegger's political orientation, if you look at it more deeply, you start to see that, um, uh, no, it wasn't problematic just because he, you know, made some anti-Semitic comments. It's actually much deeper than that. This idea that this nativism uh, makes some people superior to others. And uh, that's where this gets uh, dangerous because there are nationalist implications. Um, so deep ecology, again, the impulse, I think, has a, a, a rightness to it in terms of, oh, let's, you know, value the earth around us, absolutely. But the way its roots spread out um, can be a little bit uh, 
more problematic. Another manifestation of this that's become more common today in light of the climate crisis is dark ecology. This is a melancholic but not romantic sense of uncanny human non-human relations, um, a sense of haunting and disrepair amid climate emergency, um, a sense that capitalism has done so much damage uh, that there is this chronic disrepair in the world. Another uh, new take on this is post-humanism, which is less dualist than putting nature first. It, it realizes that humans and other species are all entangled. Uh, it's an active decentering of the human in favor of multi-species perspectives. And it's also less suspicious of technology. There's a lot of cyborg thinking in post-humanism that um, we are going to be in, enmeshed with AI in some way in the future or um, uh, goggles or wires or whatever it is, um, that uh, th there's a sense that um, there's a sci-fi future for us um, that may be more or less dystopian, but is not going to look like the uh, human-centric, anthropocentric past. So this is sort of a constellation of uh, deep ecology-related ways of thinking. Uh, we do have to go just to touch on Nazi-era environmentalism because it does pick up some of these threads um, as it continues through neo-Nazi movements today. Uh, and of course, you've heard the term Blut und Boden, blood and soil, from the Nazi era, which was very atavistic in its valorizing of uh, what was old and tribal in Germanic culture. Uh, this still shot is from a film I'm not going to make you look at today, but beyond this image, Ewiger Wald, which is uh, Eternal Forest. It was a 1936 propaganda film that uh, mixed up history in, in really um, inaccurate ways to portray this deep pagan past uh, that the Nazis wanted to pick up again in some way. They had a paradox of uh, utopian, uh, technological utopian thinking on the one hand, um, building things, creating new cities, but at the same time, this atavistic, let's look to the past way of imagining themselves. And these strains, um, unfortunately, are still uh, pervasive in uh, a lot of the right-wing environmental thinking today. Uh, and this is a propaganda poster that shows some of the agendas going on here. Reforest the land and consumerism. Um, those two things seem uh, the, very palatable to uh, degrowthers on the left as well. Uh, but there are these other really problematic things here like um, use deportation to end overpopulation, um, uh, ban kosher and halal slaughter, a death penalty for animal abusers. You know, none of us like animal abusers, but, but there is this very dark strain to this also um, that can lead to eugenics and uh, genocide ultimately. So um, the way this manifests today, uh, several ways, are in what in Austria have been called avocado politics. That means green on the outside, brown as in brown shirt on the inside. So um, politicians who market themselves as being green, uh, but also carry these eco-fascist tendencies. Um, Anti-vaccine overlap. You see some anti-vaccine thinking on the left as well, but, um, but I remember attending or just observing, I should say, uh, an anti-vaccine protest in Berlin several years ago at the height of the pandemic and uh, seeing how <clears throat> images of nature were used in the flags and posters. Um, even the COVID vaccine virus symbol had little hearts around it and it was very strange. It was all done in green colors as though, you know, this is actually something natural that we don't want to interfere with. It was very odd. Um, we also see violent uh, results of this, as I mentioned earlier, in Norway and New Zealand. Those are the uh, perhaps most uh, resonant in our minds because uh, of the scale of those massacres. Uh, the Both of those perpetrators actually had uh, manifestos or had written things about uh, this eco-fascist agenda. The Malthusian impulse is part of this also, um, that you know we have too many people on the planet and uh, we need to reduce this. And again, that can be appealing, um, especially if you live in a tourist area or a natural area that is, is very crowded. Um, as I have, I remember feeling this sometimes, uh, living in a ski community in Utah and being um, offended almost by 
the number of people and the noise and the trash everywhere and having to look at myself and realize that, oh, that's, you know, I need to be careful with uh, this sort of misanthropic feeling that I have and see if there can be other solutions for overuse of the land. So uh, another aspect of this that's important to look at is uh, eco-fascist strains in popular culture. Uh, this is something I've written about because it's so troubling and fascinating at the same time to see a Netflix series, for example, there are quite a few of these that really valorize pagan culture. For example, barbarians, tribes of Europa, um, equinox from Denmark uh, that uh, want to go back to some idealized, if very violent, vision of indigeneity. Um, this sense that, oh, we're all indigenous in some way. We all come from these tribal backgrounds where people wear facial tattoos and stab each other. And um, that this is uh, this ritual culture is uh, really meaningful somehow. And uh, it's also become a problem in Viking reenactment culture in Scandinavia, where not everyone has an eco-fascist bent, obviously, but there's enough of that going on within those communities that, um, for example, there's a blogger in Norway who removed herself from Viking reenactments because she just felt so uncomfortable with how this um, aesthetic was being used. So that's, that's one strain in Europe. In the US, um, the series Yellowstone has become very, very popular and there are ongoing debates about whether it's a right-wing show or a left-wing show. It's really something in between. It's a very interesting case in that it's about uh, a ranching family who wants to hold on to their land. And so it's a libertarian orientation really about um, land protection uh, for the sake of the individual. Uh, they also bring in uh, native culture, indigenous um, characters who are well researched on the one hand, but on the other hand, as we see in this image, also very idealized in a very romantic with capital R and perhaps also in the scene small R uh, visions of um, this idealized landscape of uh, white and indigenous people getting along and protecting the land. So um, it's maybe not exactly eco-fascist in that sense, but it also carries this uh, romanticized, idealized, nostalgic vision of uh, Montana in this case. So I want to conclude with an example of where overlapping agendas can perhaps be a bit more productive. And uh, I'm going to uh, point you toward an interview that's I believe still on the ECPS website with Darren Perry, who's a tribal leader in uh, the American West. And he's been working very hard to create um, a land restoration project at the site of a massacre, a 19th century massacre of his tribal people in uh, the 1850s. And if you look at this green field in this image, uh, the bodies of 500 men, women, and children who were killed in this massacre are just underneath the, the soil, underneath the grass uh, there. And it's a sacred place to the Shoshone tribe, the Northwest Shoshone. Uh, and they have been working with the local ranchers to uh, buy some of this land and to create an interpretive center there. Uh, they're also working with Utah State University uh, ecologists and botanists to uh, restore some of the plant life that would have been at this site during the 19th century. Uh, because of the climate crisis and changing ecosystems, not all of those plants will thrive now. And so that's been an interesting process for uh, everyone involved to see, you know, we can't necessarily plant all of the native species that used to be here. Uh, but we can at least create a healthier ecosystem. Um, and what's been really interesting about uh, this process in, in the West is that one word has started to make a difference between um, conservatives, especially uh, Latter-day Saint uh, Mormon, as they call themselves also, um, conservatives and uh, more liberal or even left-wing activists. And that word is stewardship. Um, and it's been really helpful to see how using that word can cross this boundary of different groups who might have uh, eco-populist mentalities from right or left, uh, 
but can get together on the issue of simply taking care of the land. Um, and so it may not manifest in ways that each side would prefer always, uh, but to be able to cross those boundaries and find those places of fruitful connection uh, has been really good to see. So it's not just toxic overlap of uh, eco-populisms, but there are some productive ways this can happen as well. And maybe this is something we can also discuss a little bit later today, because I'm sure there are other examples that uh, I can learn about from you. So uh, just a few, whoops, final references here. I'll go back to our slideshow. Um, and of course, there are many, many more sources on this rich material, but I wanted to share this with you so you can at least uh, follow these up if you would like to in your own time. So thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the discussion.